open your Bibles to John chapter 21. John 21. We've come to the end of the Gospel of John today. We started the book of John July 26th, and here we are um, completing the book. Um, we have walked through every passage of this book together, and we come to the final chapter today. The last two weeks, Jesus, um, he, he's been appearing to his disciples post-Easter, post-resurrection, and um, today's the final one. Um, in this, the, the last two weeks, he's confronted fear in the disciples the, the night of Easter, and he's confronted doubt in Thomas. Uh, to, to, in this final episode, we're going to see him confront shame and regret. Shame and regret. I wonder if you're dealing with shame and regret this morning. I wonder if that's weighing over you. You know, you, you just haven't measured up, have you? You, you had some major failing. You, you don't know how to heal. You feel so broken. Life hasn't turned out as you plan. You've made mistakes that don't feel like you can ever recover from. Peter felt that way too. Peter felt that way. Even though Jesus had resurrected from the dead, um, even though that had happened, they hadn't really discussed his denial, his denying Jesus three times. And so Jesus is going to do that. He's going to address that. Um, just to fill in a couple gaps before we read John 21, um, here are just three passages leading up to this scene. Luke 22. Luke 22, Jesus says this to Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Hear that one? And then hear what happened in John. Because when we were working through John, we didn't actually read this portion. Because I told you I was going to do that today. John 18. Hear the story of Peter's denial. John 18, verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to this high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officials had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Jump down to verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing warming himself, so he said to them, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter answered and denied it. P Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. You can turn back to 21 now. Peter has had a dark few weeks since that event. He runs away from the scene that night. Uh, the Gospel of Luke tells us that when, G when Peter does the third denial, Jesus is within sight of him, and he turns and looks at him. And Peter makes eye contact with him, directly sees each other. None of the Gospels say Jesus say Peter was at the crucifixion. It looks like he wasn't. He was actually off hiding somewhere, probably ashamed of himself. And then Jesus rises from the dead, but Jesus hasn't really spoken directly to Peter regarding what happened. We don't know how long after the resurrection John 21 is, um, but it's at least several days because what happened with Thomas last week in, 20, in chapter 20, 24 through 29, that was eight days after Easter. Um, 20, chapter 21 is going to take place on the Sea of Tiberias, which is 70 miles from Jerusalem, which is where Thomas's episode was, and they didn't have a car to drive there, so they had to walk there. So it, they didn't go there overnight. So for days, maybe weeks, Peter has had on his mind what he did. He's been thinking about it. He's been living in his shame and regret, not really sure if he and Jesus are on the right terms. He He's felt that way since Easter. Have you felt that way for a long time? That's been Peter's story with Jesus since the resurrection. So let's, let's, let's read what happens. I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. We're, we're going to work through the whole chapter, but, but I, wanna, I want you to hear the story in parts. So John 21, verses 1 through 14. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin... Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, 
and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work, threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came, into the, came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, but about a hundred yards. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come. And have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus answered, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. <clears throat> Something really interesting is happening here, um, because if you know Peter's story, how did his journey with Jesus begin? Well, he and his brother Andrew were on the beach cleaning their fishing net one day. And Jesus approached them and said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. So they left their nets and followed him. And best we can tell, they didn't fish again. They stopped fishing. They spent the next three years serving Jesus as he did ministry. But here they are, fishing again. At least Peter, Andrew may be there, but but Peter is in the list of the people here. They're fishing again. Thomas is with them, Nathaniel is with them, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and then two other disciples, doesn't tell us who. Um, they're all out fishing together. And this scene's actually kind of funny. It's just kind of funny, um, because finally Jesus is going to have the conversation with Peter that Peter's been waiting for. The scene's kind of funny, though. The disciples are out all night. I mean, they've been fishing all night. They're as good at fishing as I am in this scene. Like, they can't catch a thing. And they're out all night. They haven't caught anything and at least three of them are professional fishermen. Uh, three of the, Peter, James, and John are all professional fishermen. They've been doing this their whole life. They haven't caught a single fish at all. And then there's some random guy out on the beach as the sun comes up. It's like a football field away from them. And he says, hey, you caught anything? Nope, not a thing. All right, well, just do this. Let me give you a little tip. Throw your net on the other side of the boat. Just do it. Just, just believe me. Just do it. And if I'm Peter, James, and John, I'm thinking, what's this guy know about fishing? I've been doing this for 35 years. What does he know about this? But we haven't caught anything, so what the heck? Let's just do it. So they toss it in, and like immediately the net's full. Just, just immediately. When they, get to the, when they get to the beach, they count the fish. There's 150 three of them. Um, first, that's the power of Jesus and the catch. Secondly, that's eyewitness testimony. John wrote this book. He, he knows the amount that they had, 153. There's a lot of details like this in here that you had to be there to know. The boat was about a, 100 yards off. They caught 153 fish. John wrote this, but they realize it's Jesus. They, they realize it's Jesus. And, and just like Forrest Gump sees Lieutenant Dan on the dock, he dives in the boat and swims up to him, gets up there. The disciple whom Jesus loved makes note, hey, it's the Lord. They realize this guy on the beach is Jesus. Maybe he realized it from what happened. Or maybe he remembered something from the last three years. Maybe he, his mind went back to something that happened before. This scene reminds us of something else. It's in Luke chapter 5. We've seen this happen before, what happens in, in John 21. We've seen it happen. Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. This is, I told you, Peter gets called to follow Jesus. Um, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Luke gives that story in a little more detail. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let, I'll let down the nets. 
And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their net were breaking. Their, their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled the boats, the, filled both of the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, "Depart from me, for I am a sinful man." O oh Lord, for he and all who were with me were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. This has happened before. This has happened before. Perhaps this is why Peter jumps in the water. He realizes this, that, that there's still hope for him. Jesus did this before, and he's doing it again. He's providing something that he did before. And Peter gets up to the beach, and I can only imagine what, what he did when they got there. Because they got to bring this boat in 100 yards. They're hauling, you know, a whole load of fish. Peter's just there on the beach with Jesus. And maybe they had small talk. Maybe they just stared at each other. I don't know what they did. But because remember, Peter's feeling shame and regret. Perhaps he just drags his head, doesn't look at Jesus. And perhaps that's where you are this morning. You could literally stand in front of Jesus and you wouldn't know what to say because you feel so much shame over your past. The boat comes to shore, and we realize that Jesus has set up a scene here. He's done that with the catch. He, he had them catch the fish. But then something else, something that you see in verse 9. We're hit with a detail here. When they got on the land, they saw what? A charcoal fire. A charcoal fire. Specifically calls it a charcoal fire. Where have we seen that word before? Well, John chapter 18, we read it a few minutes ago. J Peter is outside of the court when Jesus is on trial, and he's warming himself around what? A charcoal fire. Matthew, Mark, and Luke just say he's warming himself around a fire. John includes the detail of it's a charcoal fire. I love standing around a fire. I, I love it. It's just something that's, that's, that's peaceful to me. Imagine you're there with me right now. You hear the crackling of the flame as you stand you smell it? You smell the smoke? Peter would have smelled the smoke of a charcoal fire as he stood around it. And the night Peter denied Jesus, he would have smelled the fire. He would have smelled it. It would have been burned in his no nostrils, for lack of a better word. He would have smelled it. And every moment from that point on for the rest of his life that he smelled a charcoal fire, he would have been reminded of that night, of his biggest failure, of his biggest mistake that he had ever made. Our senses have a way of bringing back memories like that, don't they? Maybe you see it in, in your sight. You know, we, we, we might see a sibling do something that reminds us of our passed away parent. We remember that. Maybe it's, it's, it's through hearing. You know, you, maybe you hear a song and it brings back a memory. Um, when, when I was in high school, there was this one song that I really liked. And um, I, I, on my senior trip down to Orlando, from Kentucky to Orlando, I listened to that song on repeat for like, I don't know, 55 times. I, I don't know. I needed something to pass the time. And I love the song. And now anytime I hear that song, it brings back memories from high school. Like I tried it this morning. I pulled the song up and listened to it and just thought of all these memories of, of high school. And smell does it too. There was this teacher in my high school. I never had her for class, but um, she had the worst smelling perfume I have ever smelled. Terrible. Like, like, I'd see her coming in the hallway, and I'd either get over here against the wall, or I'd go the other way. I was social distancing in 20, oh, 2009, okay, when I was around her. Um, I was in Ollie's the other day. I smell that perfume. I mean, she wasn't there, but somebody had that same perfume. Apparently. I wish they'd just quit making it, but um, Jesus is up to something with this charcoal fire. He's up to something. He's setting up a scene here. He caught all the fish to remind him of his past. He's set up the charcoal fire to remind him of the present, of what happened. And now he's going to show him his future. Look at verses 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. The disciples sit down. They have breakfast with Jesus. After they've eaten, Jesus finally confronts what happened with Peter. He's reminded him of his calling with the great catch. He's reminded him of his failure with the charcoal fire. He now has a conversation about his future. So he asked him three times, <clears throat> Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times to, to, to make up for the three denials. Three times, do you love me? Look at verse um, 16. No, 15. Do you love me more than these? Simon, do you love me more than these? We have to ask, these what? Do you love me more than these? Well, maybe you'd say the fish. Do you love me more than the fish? Do you love me more than fishing? Your life before now, do you love me more than that? And maybe, maybe. I can see that. I don't know if it's right, but maybe. You might say the other disciples. Do you love me more than Nathaniel and James and John and, and these other guys sitting here? Do you love me more than you love them? Maybe that's the right answer. I don't know. And you might say it's actually the opposite. Peter, do you love me more than these guys love me? That's a possibility. I don't know. Scholars don't seem to know which one he's asking. But does it matter? Because the answer is always yes. The answer is always yes. You love Jesus more than anything. You, you love him more than your job. You love him more than your money. You love him more than your vacation house, more than the United States of America, more than sports, more than your hobbies, more than your sin that you keep concealed, more than your family, more than any other person on this planet. You love Jesus more than your own life. You have to love him first. If you love anything more than you love Jesus, that's your God. And it's a terrible God. It's a terrible God. So do you love him? Do, do you love him more than anything else? If not, let me challenge you. Go home today and spend time in prayer casting off that love that you have for something else and replacing it with Jesus. He says, Peter, do, do you love me more than, more than these? Peter's going to be the leader of the church when it begins. He's, it, it's going to be necessary that Peter strive to love Jesus with everything he's got. He's going to start. He's going to lead this whole thing. So Jesus then says, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Peter's going to be something like the first pastor. He's going to be the first pastor of the church as it begins. And, and the, the pastor's main job is to feed and tend the sheep. To feed and tend the sheep. I hear a lot of pastors complain that they're I don't understand. I'm too busy with church people to go evangelize. Uh, look, evangelism is one of the most important jobs of the church. It is. Never want to diminish that. But the main job of a pastor is to shepherd the flock. Why is it? Why, why do you say, I'm too busy counseling and, 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 and discipling and taking care of my church people to go evangelize, and I need to be evangelizing instead? No, you're called to shepherd the flock. You're called to feed the lambs. And yeah, you evangelize as well, but the pastor feeds the lambs. He says a second time, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my sheep. Tend my sheep. And to ask him a third time. Each time that Jesus asks, do you love me? And Jesus and Peter says, yes, Jesus defines for Peter what his ministry is going to be, what it's going to be. So he says a third time, do you love me? And what does Peter do? He breaks down in tears. Verse 17, Peter was grieved because he had said this a third time, do you love me? He knew what Jesus was doing. He knew. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's giving him another chance. He's giving him another chance to respond the way he did the night of the betrayal. He's giving him another chance to make it right, to respond rightly this time. Yes, like when it's Jesus asking this time, not some 15-year-old girl around a charcoal fire. It's Jesus, and he says, do you love me? And Peter gets this chance to not say, no, I don't know him. I'm not with him. No, I love you, Jesus. I love you. So Jesus tells Peter his future, verse 18 and 19. 
This is what's going to happen to you, Peter. Someone's going to dress you and take you where you don't want to go. This is the kind of death that he's going to glorify God with. In case you're worried, Peter, Jesus does have a purpose for you. It's not over. He tells you everything about what your future is going to be. You're going to serve me until someone carries you away to go where you don't want to go. Peter, Jesus tells Peter how he's going to die to glorify God. We know from church history that Peter did eventually did ministry in Rome. He went from Jerusalem and, and made it to Rome, did ministry there. Tradition tells us they crucified him upside down. Tradition also tells us that they killed Peter's wife before him, killed him on the same day. They, they, they held Peter there, they killed his wife. They killed her first right in front of him so that the last thing he ever saw would be his dying wife. And tradition tells us that Peter looked at his wife in that moment and just said, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Then they killed him, crucifying him upside down. What, what John 21, 18 and 19 talks about. They're going to dress him and take him where he doesn't want to go. Jesus looks at Peter and says, look, in case you thought I was done with you, I'm not. Let me tell you how you're going to die and glorify me. Let me tell you how I'm going to do that. Peter's ministry, each time Peter affirms his love for Jesus, Jesus defines his ministry. So understand that as a Christian, each one of you are called to some kind of ministry. You are. That is not just for pastors and missionaries. Every Christian is called to some kind of ministry. You may be the only Christian in your place of employment, and your ministry is to reach those around you. You may be the only Christian in your neighborhood. You may, you, you, your ministry may be your kids or grandkids. Your, your ministry may be wherever you faithfully serve here at our church. Um, we got so many of you who faithfully serve our children and our youth. Um, thank you so much for that. It's, it's incredible. Let that be a model to you as you minister to others in the church to serve faithfully like they do. Look around where you are and figure out where you can be used of service by Christ to spread his gospel to people. Where can you be used? You were not saved to just sit back and wait for Jesus to come again. You were saved to do good works. You were saved to make disciples. You were saved to fulfill the great commission. Our ministry is always an expression of our love for Jesus. Whether we are pastor of a church or we clean the bathrooms of a church, our ministry is an expression of our love for Jesus. Whether we are the only Christian in our workplace or whether we have just one lost person we know. So I want to ask you, if you aren't serving Jesus actively, is it a sign that you have lack of love for him? We must love Jesus in order to properly serve him. This was Peter's commission, and this is ours. This scene is beautiful. What happens here? It's just incredible. What an amazing picture of grace. Peter no longer has to remember his failure when he smells a charcoal fire. Jesus has redeemed it. He's made it all right. He gets to remember the grace of Jesus when he smells a charcoal fire. I'd be hanging out around fires all the time if that were the case. What a beautiful picture of amazing grace. We all need new memories. We not only need life and second chances, we also need memories of our failures to be replaced by memories of hope and restoration. And that's what Jesus gives Peter. We have a God who does that. We have a God who's gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love, as we read earlier. He, he forgives our sin, and he gives us a new name and new memories. Jesus didn't just forgive Peter. He redeemed his failure. He made him new. So what about you? You feel like God is done with you? You've just done something just too horrible. You can never truly be used by God again. You're silently just hoping that when you die, God will have pity you and not send you to hell. You hope you catch God on a good day, you know, when you die. You're, you're living in such shame and regret. Is there any future for you? Have you ruined your life beyond repair? Peter denied Jesus right in eyesight of Jesus. He swore to God that he didn't know him, according to one of the gospels. One of the gospels, it sounds like he threw out some four-letter words to, to, to claim that he didn't know Jesus. He did that right in eyesight of Jesus. And Jesus forgave him and redeemed him. He made him new. What makes you think he can't do that for you? What makes you think that, that your sin is a little bit farther than the cross of Christ and the forgiveness that he offers? What makes you think that's the case? The heart of Jesus 
is to take your brokenness and transform it into something good. That's the point of him dying on the cross. That's the point of him rising from the dead in a garden, uh, a place of new life. That, that's the point. Not just to forgive your sins, not just to give you eternal life in heaven, but to transform your story, to make you new. We often think, like, Jesus died for all my sins before I got saved, and now it's up to me to, to take care of all the sins after I got saved. And that's ridiculous. You cannot pay for your sins. You couldn't pay for the sins before you got saved, and you can't pay for the ones after. Jesus did it all. Jesus did it all. Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No past condemnation, no present condemnation, no future condemnation. He's wiped it all clean. Jesus has redeemed our lives. Jesus is the God who takes terrible situations and redeems them. He takes charcoal fires that remind us of our biggest failure, and he makes them an aroma of mercy in our nostrils. He redeems our life so that every aspect of our life comes into conformity of his grace. Jesus forgives you of your sin completely, and he redeems your life to where you not, are not controlled by your sins. You're controlled by righteousness. So we see that in his next statement to Peter. Let me finish the chapter and finish the book. Verse 20. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them and the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that, well, I'm sorry, I got the emphasis wrong, leaned back against him during supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple is not to die. Yet Jesus did, not say that it was, Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Those who are forgiven by Jesus follow Jesus because he is better than their sin and he's worthy of their life. The story began with Peter being reminded of how his calling happened in Luke 5, and now it ends with something like a renewal of vows. Hey, hey, Jesus, Peter, follow me. Jesus lays out for Peter what his life's going to be like. You're going to get dressed and carried where you don't want to go. And then he says, follow me, verse 19. After he had said these things to him, he said, follow me. In other words, Peter, you're going to suffer and die for me. Am I worth it to you? If I am, follow me. Jesus was worth giving up your fishing net for. Is he worth dying for? Is he worth dying for? And so the question for you is, how about you? Jesus was worth it enough for you to come to him for forgiveness of sins. He's, is he worth you following him if that means the rest of your life you will have intense suffering? If you could know how you were going to die, would you want to know? I wouldn't. I hate surprises, but I'd rather just my death take me by surprise than to know it's coming my entire life and be watching the clock. Um, I'm way too much of a planner to, to, to have to bear that for the rest of my life. Um, but if you knew that following Jesus for the rest of your life was going to result in your death, would he be worth it to you? He would. He's worthy of your life, and he's worthy of your death. You're going to die at some point anyway. Your day is fixed, according to Scripture. It's, it's been written down. I, I don't care how safe you play it. When that day comes, you're gone. Why not live your life to the glory of God and leave your death up to him? Peter lived his life to the glory of God, and they crucified him upside down. Probably about 30 years after John 21, it was in the 60s when it happened, this is in the 30s. Um, John, on the other hand, the, the, the guy who wrote this, the one who Peter turns and looks at, John lived his life for the glory of God, and he lived to an old age. He suffered well, um, but, but he, best we understand it, he died of, an, of old age in his 90s. Well, in, in the 90s, you know, this is the 30, 60 years later he died. During his final decade, he wrote this book that we're reading. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he wrote Revelation, all when he was an old man, 10 years before he died. He lived his life to the glory of God to the very end and died. 
Whether you go out like Peter or like John, live your life for the glory of God so that you will die for the glory of God. God forbid that any of us should play it safe, avoid all risk, and never get out of our comfort zone and never do anything big for Jesus. Most of you are not going to have to die for Christ. Pro probably none of you will have to die for Christ. Most of you will more likely have John than Peter's death. You're not going to have to die for Christ. You're going to have to live for him. You're going to have to live for him. He calls you to follow him. We are forgiven by Jesus to follow him. He knows you don't do it perfectly. Look what happens to Peter. Verse 19, follow me. So you would think he's looking at Jesus, following him. But what's it say in the next two words? Follow me. Peter turned. Mm -hmm. Peter, follow me. Mm -hmm. Already failing again. Already screwing up again. Right after Jesus calls Peter to follow him, Peter gets off track. Jeez, what about this man? What about John? What about him? What should he do? He's already taken his eyes off Jesus and looking at somebody else, just like he did when he was walking on water, just like he's done so many times in his life, just like he did around that charcoal fire. He's already screwed up again. And what's Jesus tell him? His future is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you, Peter, so follow me. Stop looking around. Stop worrying about John. Look at me. Follow me. Keep your eyes on me. Stop looking around. We're like sheep. Peter's like a sheep. We're all like sheep. We so easily get off track. We, we so easily get off track, and Jesus is the good shepherd who constantly pulls us back on track. You can't make it on your own. Stay with Jesus. Jesus doesn't expect you to follow him perfectly. He knows you're going to look back at John every now and then, but he expects you to follow him. He knows you're going to stumble. He doesn't expect you to do it perfectly. He expects you to do it. Often following Jesus is two steps forward, one step back. We're going to lose sight of him. We're going to start looking at other things. But we have to constantly be reminded of verse 22. You follow me. It's almost like he points his finger at Peter. You follow me. Jesus keeps calling us back to our calling. Follow me. Keep your eyes fixed on me. Keep coming after me. And that is Jesus' call to all of us. Stop letting your past define you. Stop living in the shame and regret of your past. Christ has come to redeem you and give you a better future. So embrace that future and follow him. Pray with me. Lord, we praise you that you redeem us. Lord, you are a merciful and gracious God. <clears throat> you take our past and you make it new. You change us. You change us. We praise you that you take the charcoal fires that remind us of our, our old life and you, you redeem them and make them a, an aroma of mercy in our nostrils. You change that. You redeem us. You buy us back from our sin. You buy us back from our past. You, you, it's like Hosea. You, you come and you find us on the, on the auction place and you buy us and bring us back into your family. You do that every single time, Good Shepherd. And so would you do that in our lives today? Lord, I don't know if there's anybody here who have strayed off like that sheep, but I pray that you'd grab them and pull them back. Lord, I pray that you'd do that. Do that in, in my heart every single day. Do that in every person here's heart every single day. Help us to never take our eyes off of Jesus and look at John on the other side of us, but help us to look ahead to Jesus and continue following him, loving his grace, loving his mercy, and serving him. It's in his name we pray. Amen.